Running, jumping, vaulting, sliding, climbing, thrusting? These are all things pretty common in today's video game movement. However, movement is an area that's not often closely examined, but is usually the very first thing you'll do when playing a game. And now maybe it's because moving has become so polished with current technology that we don't pay attention to it, but over the past 20 to 30 years, it has completely evolved. From the basic two and four directional movement to a full 360 degrees and the ability to traverse environments both horizontally and vertically, movement has gone from something that was just originally included in games to something that significantly adds to the user experience. And no game has done this better or has been more influential than Mirror's Edge. But before we take a look at the impact of Mirror's Edge, I'd like to take a brief look at video game movement before and up until its release. And the perfect category to do so would be platforming games. And if you're unfamiliar, platform games are characterized by their heavy use of jumping and climbing or any other acrobatic maneuvers to traverse some sort of terrain and help the player reach their goal. And at its origins, platforming was basically, hey, Sliders are cool, and it took until 1981 when a small indie company called Nintendo thought, well, why don't we have the characters jump too? And then Donkey Kong was born. These early games were mostly played on a fixed screen where the player could move around a singular level. And around the same time, some developers realized they could move other things besides the character and side scrollers were born. These 2D games remained popular into the late 90s, but as new technology came out, many people were no longer satisfied and desired an even larger D. The third dimension brought some of the best games in the platforming genre, such as Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Spyro, and who could forget the instant classic croc Legend of the Gobos. Now moving into the 21st century, most platforming games kind of moved away from the norm. Their focus was not on the platforming primarily, but just as kind of an added feature to the main gameplay focus. Games like Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, and Assassin's Creed are great examples of this. More or less, that's basically the history up until the release of Mirror's Edge, and for a bit of backstory, released in 2008, Mirror's Edge is a first-person action-adventure platforming game developed by DICE, who is best known for creating the video game adaptation of the hit movie Shrek, and its lesser-known titles, you know, like... <laughs> the game follows Faith Connor, who is an underground parkour... Courier? 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 Courier. An underground parkour transporter who focuses on delivering private goods and sensitive information across the city that is hidden from government eyes, but kinda gets caught up in a whole bunch of shit and now people are shooting at her. But for a more simple explanation, you run and jump a lot and it's fucking brilliant. So what makes this game so good that I had the gall, the audacity even, to call it revolutionary? Well, simply put, there was no movement animated for the entirety of Mirror's Edge. And now I know what you're thinking, Tony, that literally makes no fucking sense as the game is all movement, and I will admit, it does sound a bit preposterous, but that's what I'm going to do my best here to explain to you today. So we know that Mirror's Edge is a first person game, not entirely impressive as plenty of first person games were developed before it, and even plenty from DICE as we see with their Battlefield franchise. However, DICE wanted you to be able to do things that you could never do before in a first person game. You know, you take this example, if a player approaches a fence, the usual course of action would to be find a way around it and then progress, but in Mirror's Edge, when met with the same fence, the player would instead choose to hop over it. Now, to be able to pull this off, DICE had to develop a more dynamic camera that was suited towards movement, because up until this point, most first-person games used a floating camera technique where you could control your character and move freely, but the camera would kind of be fixated on one part of the screen. So your character would move, but the camera would not. DICE wanted to move away from this and create a world where the player truly felt like they were there. They used the technique with Battlefield called Through the Gun Experience that made the player feel as if they were experiencing war through their weapon with things like sway, recoil, and the overall movement. They took this technique and applied it to Mirror's Edge and called it Through the Character Experience very original, where they would feel as if they were experiencing all of the movements Faith makes throughout the game. This was done through perception. Now, when I said earlier that DICE didn't animate any movement, I was actually telling the truth. Mirror's Edge was instead animated on the perception of movement. And now here comes the part where I try to explain this incredibly confusing statement. 
So if you were creating a first person platforming game like Mirror's Edge, how would you go about animating it? Your first thought might be to mocap the movement, which isn't a bad idea in theory, and it was actually DICE's first idea too. The first design iteration saw a camera strapped to Fate's head, but as you can see, not exactly the smoothest, and even in video game development, you need to account for motion sickness, because it's a real thing, and I can guarantee I'd probably be sick after taking maybe 10 steps on this. They tried many other iterations to try to smooth out the movement, including adding aim constraints, but none of them seemed to actually work. So after trying numerous ideas, DICE just completely scrapped the idea of trying to track Faith's movement and instead decided to hand animate every single action and move that she would make in the game to give the perception of her actual movement. If you examine the movement closely in Mirror's Edge, you can see it looks pretty close to how you would move in real life, and that's exactly what DICE was going for. Not that you're actually going to go outside and start moving, you lazy sack of shit. They created a first person mesh of Fate's hands and feet because you know those body parts are visible while moving, and made sure that they were anatomically accurate so you wouldn't feel as if you were breaking her bones with each move. The subtle use of motion blur and depth of field kind of shows either an increase or decrease in speed, and the use of multiple animations on things like jump landing or a wall run adds to the fluidity of movement, because contrary to what games of this time showed, you don't usually land from a two-story fall straight-legged like nothing happened. Tis but a scratch. Loading screens were also something that were discussed heavily in the creation of the game. Getting from one point to the other and then having to wait for the next area to load instantly kills the adrenaline the player had from the previous chase. They needed to do something fast, so you'll often see Faith go into a maintenance building where she'll either crash through a door, maybe climb through a vent system, or even ride an elevator that leads you into the next area. The art in Mirror's Edge is also something that's completely unique, but the use of strong colors was not just to be aesthetically pleasing but to also show how Faith sees the world. She's focused on objects that she can use to progress her current route, while the rest is left in her peripheral, which is a skill of an experienced parkour athlete. And speaking of parkour, the amount of movements you can perform in Mirror's Edge vastly surpasses that of any other game before its release. One of those games was Assassin's Creed, a game that came out almost exactly a year before Mirror's Edge, and was also regarded as having some of the best movement of any title up until its release. But for some reason, it pales in comparison to Mirror's Edge. Why do you think that is? Both game systems are closely related through their use of parkour. However, in Assassin's Creed, while you can perform a large number of moves, you didn't really have control of it and it felt like the game was almost automating those actions for you. You would simply hit a button to perform an action and boom, it would happen, with little to no risk if you actually messed up. Mirror's Edge actually just multiplied the amount of moves you can do and also added an element of precision. Because one small misstep and well, yeah, you're dead. In the game, you can obviously run and jump, but you can also slide to go underneath obstacles, perform a roll when landing from a large jump to cushion your fall, vault over small objects like vents and pipes to help maintain speed, cat leap to vertical objects like ledges, walls, or fences to help pull yourself up, shimmy across those ledges that you're hanging from, wall run to clear any large gaps or to scale large walls, climb up poles on the sides of buildings and also slide down them, you can balance across thin beams, swing from pipes or bars, bash through doors or glass while moving at high speeds, tic-tac so you can push off a wall and make it to another obstacle, and even zip line between buildings. Mirror's Edge also makes use of the fight or flight system where you'll have to choose to either engage the enemy or find your best escape route. Should you go for a disarm on an enemy and keep moving, pick up a weapon and decide to fight, or just evade entirely? These are all decisions you'll need to make while playing. Fighting? Eh, almost never the correct option, however, as Faith is usually ill-equipped to fight, and picking up a weapon will significantly slow her movement. In fact, if you pick up anything that's larger than a pistol, you won't be able to grab onto ledges after jumping, which is a pretty big part of the game. But in no way should you think that running is the less exciting option, because you'll still have to dodge enemies while bullets are flying past and the angry sounds of the AI are in the background. All of these techniques encapsulated together make for one of the most unique and polished movement systems in a game still to this day. And you can see its footprint in so many other games including Dishonored, Dying Light, Titanfall, Brink, Ghost Runner, and many more. And as we stand here today we can say that movement has become an integral part of gaming. Being able to perform certain maneuvers or traverse difficult terrain with ease just adds to the user experience. And without Mirror's Edge, I don't believe we would have advanced as well as we have or as quickly. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Mirror's Edge is one of my favorite games of all time, so I was very, very excited to make this video. 
And if you haven't already, I highly recommend giving it a shot. It holds up extremely well for a game that is 13 years old. Sure, it has its shortcomings like being a bit too linear and having a pretty meh story behind it, but those are changed in Mirror's Edge Catalyst, the 2016 reboot that gives you a far better story and a more open world style of gameplay. Also, if this video has even made you slightly interested in the game, please check out some of the speedruns. They utilize insane speed tech to make you move faster than you even thought possible. And if you're trying to check out some IRL parkour content, I recommend Storer. They're probably the best parkour channel and have a lot of rooftop content similar to what you'll see in Mirror's Edge. I'm also going to leave a link in the description of a video conference featuring Mirror's Edge lead programmer Jonas Aberg and lead animator Tobias Dahl discussing the entire creation of the movement system. It's super interesting and it's actually where I got a lot of my information from, so if you have like an hour or so to spare, definitely go give it a watch. I learned a ton just in that little amount of time. I also have to give a shout out to all the wonderful people who have supported me on Patreon. You can go over there, the link will be in the description. Got a lot of different tiers and cool benefits that you can get exclusively on there, including things things like early access or even having your name included in the video like these wonderful people. And also recently I announced a partnership with Apex Gaming PCs where I have my own very own custom PC line. So if you guys want to go ahead and check that out, the link will also be in the description to where you can actually purchase a PC that I helped actually create the build for. And you can use code Tony for 5% off of that, which is actually quite a lot of money when it comes to a PC because they are fucking expensive. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you again. I appreciate you so much for watching. Hope to see you here next time.